Hello, we are here at the Encounters at the Hebraica University in Mexico City. We have the privilege to have with us two visiting scholars that are working in Mexico in different projects with the Academic Exchange German Service. Thank you for being with us. We have here Professor Danny Kratz and we have here Professor Maria Rubenkamp. Thank you for being with us. Uh, you are social uh, scientists, uh, scholars of law, anthropology, uh, history. I would like to know uh, if you n need to pick up three main problems in the contemporary world. What would you say are the key three main problems in contemporary world today? Climate change. Well, <laughs> climate collapse because change is a wrong word, social inequality, and what do we do for the first migration meeting? Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate more about the climate? I think that all of us are aware of the dramatic uh, consequences of the way in which our societies are built, and uh, with the economic system, the production system, the consumerism, etc. But can you elaborate about, you mentioned social inequality and migration. Can you elaborate a little bit to understand because there are different ways to approach these topics? But actually, all of them are also interrelated. I mean, one of the things you cannot do without each other is always seeing how the world is interconnected in, in everything. Um, well, climate change, I don't think that there is a lot to be explained about it. In, in the sense that it is really affecting us. Meanwhile, um, the rainy seasons in Mexico are changing. I remember the time in Mexico when it started raining at three and stopped at five, mm -hmm. and that time is long ago. And in Central America, we see how the changing climate is already really threatening the livelihood of many people. And um, even in Germany, which is a country that supposedly is not that affected of climate change, we have actually, after India, I believe, the highest rate of climate um, people dying because of heat collapse. Wow. And that is something that Germans also don't uh, know that much. But even Germany, in that sense, is, is, is already like super hit by it. Because besides rots and all of the other um, effects that we already hear in the media. And uh, social inequality also is like so closely related because mostly the climate collapse is affecting poor people much stronger than rich people. And at the same time, it is also like a gender-related aspect because it is hitting women different than men also. So we are having a totally interrelated area here. And in terms of migration, of course, we have the first migration starting because of areas that get inhabitable because of the climate problems. So even though these are three different areas, all of them are closely interconnected and I don't think that you can address them like only addressing one without addressing the other ones and you can also not solve them without addressing the other ones. I think there's a lack of uh, sustainability in how the uh, economic and as well the societal system was built and designed and I think we can see it very clearly in the incredible amount of petrol we need in order to get from A to B, the amount of distances which have become common to us and as well in the, in the building structures. I mean, in Mexico City it's a fairly even climate, so you're not necessarily tied to heating. But in other parts you're tied of the world, you're tied to heating or you're tied to cooling mm -hmm. your, the buildings down. And in the Middle East where I live, what I find striking is that the native population which lived in the, in the Ottoman times in the, in the area of what is now Israel, they actually had buildings which were adapted to the climate. But none of their building, 
of their of their knowledge of, of building and architecture has been uh, taken over in the state of Israel. So you have these um, the um, the train buildings which um, which are which are heating up no end or they cool down because it's mere concrete. And then you have all of the um, high rise now, which is completely made of glass on all sides. And in the winter you're freezing, and in the summer you're dying of the heat. So the amount of electricity and resources we waste is, I think, it's it's sinful. It, for me, it's completely at odds with the notion of tikkun olam. Perfect. Yes, we are. And um, one question is: Do you think that our theories? that we inherit from the 19th century with the great sociologists, historians, anthropologists. And, uh, do you think that we have, within the social sciences and the humanities, the conceptual frameworks to understand what's going on? Are we continue to look what we know to look but not what is going on? Should we uh, be more open to different approaches some say from traditional sources, uh, pre-modern, or new alternative ways to understand what's going on. What do you think? Because in some senses we hear uh, political scientists, sociologists, political scientists that wants to explain this crisis with the lens of the past. What do you think about that? Do you think that we are, do we have the instruments the, that, that we need to be helpful for our societies and uh, be a factor of positive change in these situations? Well, I think we are at a time change, really. Um, in that, I agree with the German Chancellor, which is uh, something I still do. <laughs> um, but I think that we do have the knowledge to, to address the problems we are facing, but I think we have to do it in a very different way that we have done it so far. Partly, I agree with Dan, um, look back into the past or in how things have been done before, which were more sustainable and agreeable with the nature, would be part of uh, thinking, but basically I believe we have to restructure our entire lifestyle and we have to question the consume, we have to question the growing economy which has like supposedly a reason to grow all the time by itself and um, there of course there are many people questioning that um, idea but the problem is that the governments are not questioning and that they are also not setting limits uh, to the income earning of, of the oligarchy of the world and besides that it is very clear that we have to set limits over there. Um, we have to also ask ourselves in our daily lives also how we can contribute to the change and if we look at each ourselves I'm also like not the one who's like saying like okay I'm not going to fly to that conference because my climate um, my climate patterns are going to turn worse because of course on the other hand the, the way to change things, also in my opinion, are very much related to working interdisciplinary, working over the areas we're working now. We're working like universities, look, working within university, the civil society is working, the politics and the economy, and we all have to come together from the different areas to address the problem. That is one of the things. And education is also playing a huge role. The education, how we have it now, to go like super specialized in the different areas is of course super important. But what we also need are like all-rounders who are going to bring all that knowledge together um, to address the problems from different sides, not only from sociology, from the climate specialists, from... We all have to come together in that and then on top of it, it is also something that we have to do internationally. So what I believe is we need much more money into science but not into the specifics, but into the all over, and we need to work fast and very effective together internationally without all the problems of corruption and nepotism and all the problems that we know in each of the academic systems to solve that problem. So I think we have to rethink in so many ways. 
Danny, what would you like to add? I think the neoliberalization of the academic systems has pretty much been breaking our backs because we train students very specifically, but the three of us have the luxury we're trained broadly because we train in different stuff than we did our PhDs in in the end and then we developed into different areas and we could because we had that overview because my, my actual BAs in cultural studies and history and as you asked about history I think the long view is very important and yes you can take out of the sources but you need to you cannot apply them one on one and I can give you one um, example um, there is this wonderful book on a very sad topic which is called uh, anti-semitism on social media and the two editors brought people together who work on this completely new phenomenon and I was struck it's like we don't even know the totals we're actually dealing with are we dealing with profiles are we dealing with people what the hell are we dealing with and then I said in the book presentation and one of the colleagues who was present felt that the current anti-Semitism on social media could be um, compared to the, to the event of the Luther Bible and to uh, anti-Semitic depictions in church windows. And I said, no, because this is not user-generated content. People couldn't read and write back then. And they didn't travel those distances. And then distance and international communication comes in and social media immediately. The time-space compression and the hyper-velocity we have, we need to tackle them with new ideas. And I think for that, I agree with Marion, we need transnational teams. We need to be able to, to work without the constraints that the disciplines and as well the funding bodies and the universities put on us. Because the people who manage education are usually and research are usually not scientists, mm -hmm. and that doesn't work. I mean, I'm very clear on that. That clearly does not work. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you completely. With you, we need new approaches. We need to work uh, breaking the, the the structures of the disciplines. You know that Eugene Rosenstock-Hughes it is a Jewish intellectual from who converted to Christianity in the 20s in Germany and became a a huge scholar of, of patristic studies, of law, of sociology, of linguistics, he was brought to Harvard when he escaped because rationally he was defined as a Jew. He went to Harvard, it was a catastrophe because he was interdisciplinary completely, so the department of law said yes, but he's mingled with uh, this other area, so at the end he went to Dartmouth in which he found the space that he needed to, this is a case, Today he will be very popular in terms of working with a wide perspective and not just this disciplinary perspective of the methodological nationalism or this kind of, of perspective with narrow our vision. I would like to ask you from your experience working with citizenship, immigration, law, what's going on with the political systems? Why worldwide? in different countries, with different traditions, the, the feeling of the people is that the, the system are not working properly. What would you say from your experiences, why uh, there is so uh, a sense of alienation from politics, there is a sense of uh, the people is, uh, I would say, angry uh, on the politics, on the political classes, what are your thoughts about these topics? Do you like to start them? <laughs> I think one of the main problems we encounter is the lack of belief in democracy and the um, increasing belief in populism. And populism answers very easy answers for very difficult questions. And I think it helps people through their everyday life because there seems to be again this kind of locus, this small world which you can control, whereas effectively things are pretty much out of control and obviously populist governments serve that purpose. I mean, we see them in, in Europe, in North America, in South America, we see them in Eastern, in Eastern Europe, in, in Asia. It's a, I think it's a general trend that if people feel under threat, they try to, to, to preserve what they have and then they turn pseudo-conservative but actually populist. Mm -hmm. Which is sadly then to say that we haven't learned much from the past. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not even sure whether it is like a lack of belief in, in democracies. I think the belief in democracies, in most democracies, is still strong. The problem is that we feel that we are not represented truthfully by our governments. And I think that is the source of populism also a lot. But once again, I'm not a specialist for it. I, I answer that more like coming from my, my belly feeling. Um, what I feel is that many be don't believe anymore in what they hear. And what they really want to hear are clear and honest words, rather than all the diplomatic talk that we hear in the politics and that we also hear in the diplomacy. And I think that is why people like Trump and, and uh, other populists um, are very well received because you feel at least that they are honest in what they are saying, even though it might be a lie. So I think what we really need is like getting honesty back into the debates. Uh, to finish this uh, space, I would like to ask you, you have studied from different perspectives the contemporary Jewish experience, uh, issues of history, of anthropology, of migration, of citizenship. What would you say something important that you learned from your research from about the Jewish people, history, the values, the transformations that we experience in this tragic and amazing last century? I think by looking at the particularistic Jewish experience, I've become much more aware that the Jewish experience compares to many other experiences and the that Jews are in terms of Levi Strauss good to think with. So, because migration is always uh, is oftentimes related to a Jewish experience, but in fact migration is, is the standard. And I think that was something I was less aware of because, uh, you know, coming from the background I come from, it seemed to me very much Jewish. And the other migrants that I grew up with were labor migrants, but effectively when you look deeper into society, migration is the standard. And I think. I approached it through a Jewish lens, but I've become much more compar yeah, comparativistic, definitely. Mario? I even wonder whether we have to leave this behind a little bit in order to, to address the problems that we have to address. That we have to think more like common humans than about small minority groups and identities. I am not sure whether the identity politics that are right now governing so many of the debates, at least in Germany, but I also see that in the US a lot, are really helpful for approaching what we have to approach. Mm -hmm. That I agree with. I think identity politics kill many discourses because there are, it's become increasingly difficult to have critical analysis if identity politics jump in, and not because you want to offend somebody, but because you just present historical or empirical data. And that I find very problematic. Okay. Also problematic for science. Yes. Well, I would like to thank you very much, Professor Danny Kranz, Professor Marion Robenkamp. And I would like to say that uh, in these topics, I identify with my teacher, my mentor, Rabbi Marshall Meyer, who was, without the name, a rooted cosmopolitan. He was a real person embedded in, in one culture, but was a citizen of the, <coughs> of the world, with a vision, a global vision, to improve <coughs> the situation of all the citizens of the world. Thank you very much.